Greetings, my excellent friends, and welcome to Ask Mark number 23. Number 23, that's the number of the universe, isn't it? Number 23 and 5, I believe. Questions, comments down below, please, about that, um, especially if you've seen the Jim Carrey movie number 23. Anyway, so the intro of today's show is a little bit different. Um, I didn't check my audio cables or at the beginning part. I thought everything was fine. Um, and then I filmed the first question or the intro and started the first question and the little audio jack on my uh, audio just, just a little bit, which basically means it went blah, 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 to um, so there was basically no audio on my half. Obviously Mark being the professional that he is, he has audio. So obviously we can just jump straight to his um, answers on the first question. So that is, the, 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 get my words out. Let's jump to the first question. So it's from Floppy, Flopi. Still not too sure how to pronounce your username. So let us know in the comments below. Anyway, they say, thanks for the video, uh, which is the why you should have local video. I never really could uh, considered diving local. So thanks for piquing my interest. You are welcome. Uh, when you say there's lots to see, can you give some examples of what you've seen and where? E.g. wildlife and wrecks, etc. Thanks. Okay, over to you, Mark, and past Sean, I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, you can get nudibranchs off the coast of Scotland um, over over most of the UK. Um, yeah, you still like swimming through these kelp forests and you see this little uh, sort of dot of white with yellow on it and it's actually a teeny tiny little nudibranch um, just kind of chilling out. Um, I've seen starfish up in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot to see. Um, the training center that I learned to dive in. They've got sturgeon, uh, they've got perch, they've got double-decker buses and planes. Uh, another good one is uh, Stony Cove. They've got all sorts of, uh, sort of they've got an aeroplane that you can swim through the center of it. Um, they do have fish in there, they're a bit more elusive. Um, the, the one in Gildenberg, there's a sunken forest, which is pretty cool. So it's an old brick quarry and, um, and one section of it was just woodland. When it flooded, of course, the, the trees stayed where they are. And uh, now you just had this like, it's kind of eerie, um, sort of dead forest that you can swim through. If you touch anything, all the silt just uh, sort of comes off of it. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, you got Endak, they got all sorts of interesting things. So yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting stuff to uh, to see when you're diving local. Um, yeah, it's uh, most people just think, oh, it is just green, isn't it? Like, no, there's tons to see. Even if you like, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's stones and rocks. Uh, <laughs> some of them are round and some of them are pointy. Um, no, they. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, river diving as well, especially around bridges, because people drop stuff. Um, so yeah, loose change. I mean, that was um, uh, oh, what's it called, Stony Cove. They have a swim through, which is underneath the sort of balcony section of a pub. So yeah, you get a few bits and bobs down there. Um, there is a bit of broken glass. So you do have to be a little bit careful. Um, but yeah, you can find stuff if, if that's what you're into. Just bring your little metal detector and you can find some stuff. Um, but yeah, there, there is tons to see and it is definitely worth it. And the visibility is far better than most people believe. Um, I mean, it, it does swing to the other end of the spectrum where there can be terrible visibility in certain areas. It just depends on the weather and all sorts of conditions. Um, but yeah, if anything, the best time to go, I mean, my, one of my best dives ever was, would have been about March. So it's coming towards the end of winter and things are starting to brighten up, but they haven't brightened up yet. And I went diving the day, like the first day of, not the first day of spring, but the first day when like the heavens opened and, uh, and it was brilliant sunshine. Of course, all the algae has been chilling out on the bottom for the winter time. Um, so they're all sort of down. So the visibility is just incredible. It's cold and it's been cold for the past few months. So there's been a few divers in that area stirring everything up. So I could see like 20 plus meters easily. And this is a dive site where normally like five meters is kind of acceptable. Um, so yeah, 
it's there's definitely plenty to see. It's just pick the right time, pick mm. the right area. Cool. Excellent. Mm. That's fantastic. Fantastic <laughs> answer to that question. So Nick, Nick, question number two, we just from Nick Jabal. I want to yep. say that right, Jabal. Uh, he left this comment Jabal. on the, the Regal Recon Fins. Zegal. Zegal. That, I don't know why I said Regal then. <laughs> yeah. I think it was my dyslexia. Literally was like, Zegal, no, that doesn't sound just, right. Just, just mixing the letters yeah. up. Yeah, that's yeah, it. It's the, sorry, it's the Regal Zecon Fin. <laughs> Uh, anyway, he says there's a gear company, uh, and then he says can't remember who, that uses a cardboard punch hole hanger that is tied uh, to the fins for sale. This way they don't use plastic to store their fins whilst trying to sell. Yeah, so that was because in the Zegel Recon fin uh, like review, product review thing that I did, um, I mentioned that, okay, here's how they come. They come in a plastic bag. And because um, most, at least 99% of fins do come in just plastic bags because there's nothing, there's no real like alternative. Mm. I think some manufacturers, and I think someone else actually commented, is that they, they're trying with like mesh drawstring bags which yeah, a few manufacturers have experimented with that. The, the downside is, is the additional cost. And of course, they don't really wanna pay for it. So they're gonna push that additional price onto the end consumer. Mm -hmm. And of course that makes their product that much more expensive in the in the lineup so they're kind of reluctant to do that um so yeah just trying to think of alternatives basically to yeah just plastic bags i mean they're kind of single use you can reuse them if they, if you want to the handles they always end up just breaking off because they're they're just like heat glued onto mm. the uh, to the actual plastic bag but the like newer alternatives like the vegetable starch plastic bags that a lot of wetsuits are coming in they're quite delicate um it's it's a thin membrane it's a lot like a plastic bag but it is it is quite delicate and if you do pull it um it will whoosh, tear straight through mm -hmm. so a heavy pair of fins big old pair of like hollis f2s they're never going to hold a pair of them uh you need something with a bit more clout so yeah, maybe we might start to see more fins coming in uh, sort of mesh bags, reusable bags. We're seeing like fourth element, some of their stuff is coming in a uh, like a fabric cloth bag for their um, uh, some of their sort of suits and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think in the coming generations, because a lot of the manufacturers are super um, sort of into their uh, sort of eco friendly packaging now, I think X Deep have officially gone 100%. Um, like recyclable. Awesome. Um, most of their stuff comes in um, sort of cardboard boxes. I think they're fins as well, maybe. I can't remember. I know their BCDs definitely do. Can't remember about their fins, but um, yeah, going forwards, I don't think we're going to get them in um, not every single pair of fins from Mara Scuba Pro, Oceanic, everywhere. I don't think they're all going to come in um, sort of cardboard boxes, but we might start to see reusable mesh bags going forwards so yeah i mean you've got, you got to start somewhere really at the end of the day because mm -hmm. i mean although lots of people have been fighting the war against plastic for some time you know it's really not hit the mainstream what in the past maybe four years where kind of brands are like trying to be a lot more rico friendly with things yeah, um yeah and like like you say, like even though like the flimsy biodegradable plastics at the moment that they use for wetsuits are fine, hopefully maybe in a generation or two they would have found uh, a, a thicker way to make them, if that makes sense. So then they are more yeah, durable. Yeah. So then you can put them in fins. You can make the same bag out of um, you know for your BCDs and stuff. Um, mm. So yeah, it's just it's just in all honesty, it's just a waiting game. I think the issue is a lot of people want things now and things don't happen that way you know what i mean like yeah we, no. it would be ideal that we would stop all stop using plastic and like you, from from your, your stuff that you buy at simply scuba.com to the bananas that you buy somehow or for some reason that are in plastic um mm, yeah until that sort of thing you know changes i guess but that sort of thing is not gonna it's not gonna happen overnight basically uh, but you need no. these steps you need brands to think about eco to then go okay so we made this how this is all biodegradable what can we do to make it stronger 
to get it to everyday public, you know, so these steps need to be taken. So we're getting yeah. there, basically. Yeah. It's just... Yeah, it's, it's also a, a huge effort for a manufacturer mm. to change that one aspect. Yeah. Because they'll order these uh, for fins in like the tens of thousands. Mm. Um, and then they're not gonna just say, right, no, we, we've still got 6,256 um, left in stock, but no, we wanna go eco-friendly, we'll just bin these. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's irresponsible. Mm. So they're gonna continue um, to that line and then in the manufacturing process, yeah, they, they've got to go through all of that. They've got to change all the things. They've got to get the new things made to swap over efficiently. And they still have to sell through their mm. remaining stock. So yeah, it's, it's a matter of, okay, yeah, they can sort of put out this statement that yeah, as of today, we are completely eco-friendly, but yeah, you might still see some things in plastic that have just been sat on shelves for a little while. Yeah. Um, so don't be too upset with them. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's they, they are changing. It's just mm -hmm. it's going to take some time. Yeah, it takes time. <clears throat> and you got you got to, like they say, there's a phase, isn't there? You know, from what mm -hmm. they were to who they want to be or what they want to become. You've got that yeah. that phase, haven't you? Cool, man. All right, anyway, let's uh, move on to question number three. So this is from DH. He says, curious question. When would an open-ended DSMB like that, I'm guessing this is on the X-Deep DSMB video, yeah. and like that yeah. ever be a better choice than a closed cell? Uh... Excellent, that's um, brilliant. Uh, I can't honestly think. I can think of one okay. intricate way where it might be beneficial to have an open-ended DSMB, and that's if you wanted to send it up and then pull it back down to you. Um, I don't know why you'd want to do this. Synchronized uh, DSMBing, Bob it like little bubble ones coming out of the ocean. Yeah, <laughs> the, the only thing, the only thing that I can think of, and it will be a huge, huge pain logistically to try and do it would be to attach a second line to the top of the DSMB and one to the bottom so you send it up with two lines going up and then it's on the surface and if you want to pull it back down you pull on the one on the top so it pulls the top of the DSMB down so all the air rushes out of the bottom and you can then pull it back down to you whilst you're still underwater. I've no idea why you'd want to do that because you want to make a flappy inflatable army wave man. <laughs> so then you can kind yeah. of do it half. Um, but it, ah. in, for, for, for most divers, no, I can't think of any beneficial. The main benefit of um, open-ended DSMBs is the cost. Uh, they're a lot cheaper because there's less um, manufacturing that goes into it, there's less parts that go into it. Um, so, yeah. Are they quicker to go up? The, does that make a difference? No, nope. if anything, they're slower because you can't use a. Um, oh yeah, uh, you can't use inflatable. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could if you had one of those um, uh, sort of push button like spray things. Mm. Um, but otherwise, no, they, they they might roll up a bit neater because they don't have the valves and stuff. Um, but um, but no, I, I, I far prefer closed cell, or at least the sort of semi-closed, the one with the duckbill valves, yeah. the fluted ones that, um, that shut themselves. Because then, yeah, when they get to a certain size, they shut the bottom and they are a closed cell, so mm. gas cannot escape. So even if it does flop over onto its side, gas can't escape out the bottom, it's trapped. Uh, so you just pull on the cord at the bottom and it goes back upright. Um, yeah, oh, I don't think there's any real benefit to, uh, to open-ended, apart from, yeah, saving a few quid. And you can buy those open-ended uh, DSMBs at simplyscuba.com. <laughs> you sure can. <laughs> Uh, swiftly. <laughs> uh, to, to be fair, they do the job. I've used them before, and yeah, all you have to do is just keep a bit of tension on the line. Um, but yeah, it's, for me, it's far easier just to get a closed cell. That way, whatever gas you put into it is staying in it until you physically pull on that cord. Uh, Okay, I want to take this, take this to the comments, guys. If you, you guys and girls, sorry, if you use an open-ended DSMB over a closed one, let us know in the comments below why 
Um, and then, yeah, de defend it, because Mark has not defended the open <laughs> DSMB one bit. The usual, the usual, um, not excuse, um, <laughs> but, but, but reason why people say open-ended is so that they can use the exhaust from their, um, from their primary or an octo. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the real uh, sort of proper way to do it would be from the exhaust to actually blow out because then your buoyancy isn't changing yeah because the buoyancy of your lungs is being transferred from your body to the uh, to the smb yeah but you can do that with a closed cell you just inflate it through the nozzle and then you shoot that up and then you take a breath of air and you're still neutrally buoyant um, i like how you started to defend it and then you didn't defend it at the end bash it straight back down <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah, so if you use an open-ended, let us know why in the comments below. Okay, so let's swiftly, quickly, hurriedly move on to question four. Uh, so this is from Valkyrie. I want to say this Valkyrie. It looks like Valkyrie to me, but... Uh, it's kind of... I yeah, can't say Zeebel, Valkyrie, so... But it's, it's kind of Valkyrie, but it's it's missing... Uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's like Val Val Valkyrie. Valkyrie. Ikea. Yeah. Sorry about that, I've just butchered your name. Anyway, they left this question on the Zeagle. I said it right that time, scope yep. mask. Sorry, the the Eagle Mokoku Turfkirk mask. Seagull um, scope. <laughs> the, yeah. Oh, I love the scope. Uh, anyway, so they say, uh, do the straps start losing elasticity as the years go by on this mask? So, yeah, people, yeah, marks, it, elasticity. Yeah, it, it's kind of more your speciality, but I mean, the, the Zeagle scope, it has that relatively new, like, elastic webbing. Instead of a standard silicone strap with the two kind of straps that go behind you, it has that uh, sort of flat um, elastic tape, basically. Um, it's got little waves of, um, like, sticky uh, detailing on it, so it grabs onto the back of your head. You have two sort of adjustment buckles um but yeah it's just like elastic bungee uh i imagine it wears out over time but probably no longer than um your, your standard silicone strap i don't know what would you say sean uh what? i don't know anything about the snow from your well, snowboarding actually, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> snowboard well to be fair yeah so this this system is used on any type of goggle other than scuba diving, well, and scuba diving now, but very little in scuba diving. So, you snowboarding, obviously skiing, mountain biking, yeah. dirt cross, literally anything that you can think of that you need to protect your eyes, this system is used on their goggles. Um, swimming goggles. Swim, I think they do, they do have a do system I? like this That's in cool. swimming gear, yeah. <laughs> even, even, um, my little boy, he's got some sunglasses. And again, mm. they have a system very similar to this. It's not exactly the same, but the, the premise of the silicon is, or not the silicon, sorry, like the fabric, should we say, yeah. strap, and the compression works, is very similar to this sort of uh, style. Mm. Um, and it really baffled me that people in the comments, I don't know, where, and again, I'm, I'm not pinning anyone in particularly, and I'm not gonna ruffle any feathers on here, but it gets to the point of, we did a video about like the future of scuba diving and, and why things sometimes don't advance. Because in the comments, everyone's like, oh no, this is rubbish, oh, silicon all the way. And I'm like, okay, fair enough, you like your silicon straps. We don't this like type change. <laughs> <laughs> This strap system has been around for years. Yeah. And I'm talking year, like year, li literally 20, 30 years. It's probably been around longer than I've been on this planet, <laughs> especially, you know. All it is, is like with anything, will it lose elasticity? It will eventually, yeah? Mm. But not for a very, very long time. It all depends on how you look after the goggle how often you look after the mask, how often you look after the strap. Basically, it depends on how you treat it when it's out of the water. I have a pair of goggles that I use for snowboarding and the occasion on riding my downhill mountain bike. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't get used every day, um, but they get used maybe three or four times, you know, a month, three or four months in the year, and like every weekend, say. Um, and I've had them for nearly 10 years, and the elastic on it, the strap on it, is absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. the, the, the rubber on the inside that holds onto you, 
it's still there, hasn't broken, it's absolutely fine. But when I don't use it, they get put in their bag and they get stored away properly. Yeah. If I need to clean them, I clean them. Basically, yeah, I take care of them. And because of that, um, you know, they've lasted longer. Yep. And also as well, the, the ones I've bought aren't cheap. I haven't gone for the cheap knockoff stuff from China, you know. Mm -hmm. I think these goggles cost me like nearly 200 pounds, but they are amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the scope, well, that's about 40 odd quid, isn't it? Or at least. Or, no. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's yeah. like 50, 60. Um, but <clears throat> from the design and obviously editing that video, the quality of that strap is really, really good. Now, mm -hmm. obviously it's a bit different when you go to depths. Um, you, you're not too sure how much pressure will alter that strap. And I understand that that's with any, anything really, you know, with wetsuits, they thinner over time. But you will have to wear that mask and you will have to dive every single day, probably for a very, 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 very mm. long time. And I'm talking years mm. for, it, for it to actually really alter that sort of strap system. Yeah, um, I think that's one what of I'm the, getting at. Like, one of the it's main... Just it just annoys me. <laughs> We don't like change. Um, one of the main things is going to be like environmental. Uh, if you're diving in chlorine pools, uh, if you leave it to dry out in the sun, uh, sort of salt crystals and stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah, as Sean says, just look after it and it'll last forever. Um, yeah. Wash it down with fresh water. What? Let it dry. I literally was just about to say sun. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, th I think more than like physically the act of going diving, I don't think that's going to really sort of wear it out. But um, yeah, I think more like storage, uh, like extreme heats, extreme colds, because rubber or elastic, whatever it's made out of, yeah, it's going to wear over time. But yeah, look after it, do your best, and it'll look after you. Yeah, because that's the thing. If these, if these sort of technology, I'm not saying that we have to embrace this technology as scuba divers, but if you think about it, so taking it from the hiking world and the mountain biking world, just generally the outdoors above ground uh, activities that I like to do, yeah. um, every year or every even every ten years, there is some sort of te technological advance that makes things lighter, that makes things stronger, mm. that just makes things better about the sport that you're doing. And it's only really, I only really realize how bad scuba diving the industry is with that sort of tech when people are still basing things on strap and silicon strap and they're like, oh, we don't ever, we don't want to change them. Like, but, but, but why? Like you, you should evolve, everything else evolves. Yeah. So why doesn't, literally scuba diving, I, I understand the, the motto, if it works, it doesn't need fixing, yeah. but that doesn't mean you can't be innovative better. and <clears throat> I can't even say the words yeah. and make things better, make things lighter. Mm. You know, it's like things, is, people are still stuck in, well, it worked back then, so it works now. And that's cool to have, mm. but the problem is if you're not advanced in your, it, it's like if they were to do that with them, um, if there was no advancements in dive computers and algorithms, mm. you'd still be using your tables. You know, that's cool, <laughs> but you need to have that in the wetsuits and companies are, you know, it's almost like this eco push mm. has pushed other, you know, for us to think about the structure and the technology of how things are in scuba diving, which is good. But it just, I just, yeah, it just baffles me. I'm like every, every, like when we used to film out the old Simply, every time a hiking jacket would come out, it would have some sort of new technology, some mm. sort of new membrane. And I'm like, oh, Mark, what are you filming? Oh, I'm filming the same mask as last year. It just comes in a deeper type of black. Yep, and I'm like, yep. is there no other, <laughs> like there's no. no technical advances to anything. I'm like, this is, it's, it's mad. It's, it's maddening <clears throat> to me. Like out of all the other sports, even like the gloves that I bought, mm. like they're lighter, they're more breathable, but they're more agile than the last pair I've got. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I only bought my other pair of glo uh, uh, gloves about two years ago when I was in Whistler. Yeah, yeah, no, the, it, 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 it is funny. It baffles me. Yeah. It really does baffle me about you, you, you blooming scuba divers <laughs> and not wanting change. Yeah. Well, some of you, not all of you. There are a lot of people out there that yeah. are embracing this sort of thing. I mean, X Deep think... are the poster child mm. of doing things a bit differently um, and it working. Uh, everything from their bolt yeah. snaps to their BCDs, they're just, mm. yeah. People are going, huh, actually, that is better. Um, it is just, yeah, people are set in their ways and it's, oh, that's how my instructor do it, so that's how I should do it. Um, mm. 
yeah, no, there, there needs to be a, a bit of a like independent evolution where people go, oh, actually, yeah. that is better. I'm going to go for that one. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah the, um, the manufacturers will follow suit and go, oh, well, this is what everyone's diving on. I'll make something like that. Um, yeah, we'll see. Exactly. Break the mold a little bit. It, it. It, it will happen. It just... It just it's just weird that it doesn't happen every ten years with scuba. It's more like every fifty years every where generation. something changes. <laughs> <laughs> it literally is like that. Anyway, swiftly moving on. Um I cannot wait to read the comments of this video. Do, do you want um, me, I didn't mean to offend do you want me to anyone. This one? Uh, yeah, you can read. Well, you, to be fair, these questions this week were part picked by Mark. I did, and yeah. when I skimmed over them last week, uh yesterday, sorry, not last week, I saw this one and I was just like Oh, he's glazing yeah. over. So, yeah. so this one comes from uh, from Darren Brewer, and it was all about a, a dive that he was on, and um, it's just sort of unsure on whether they did the right thing. So, starting from here, um, I used the uh, the tag this time. Oh yeah, hashtag Ask Mark. Thank you. Makes it a lot easier for us to find. Uh, if you do have any questions, comments, queries, corrections, add that hashtag. It makes it a lot easier for us to find. Um, uh, 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 anyway, I've just watched one of your videos on twin sets. I'm, I'm going to skim some of this until it gets to the good stuff. Uh, anyway, I've just watched one of your videos on twin sets as I'm heading down this route and a comment brought a previous dive to mind. I have to say, I still feel bad about what's um, about it, but wanted your opinion. So 14 meters and lost my dive buddy at an inland dive site. Okay, that's kind of best case scenario because if it's an inland lake you can't go too far it's it's a lake it's okay. not an ocean um so we both had done less than 50 dives so they're still fairly green at this point uh and i still have bloody bloody covid I, I, don't, I don't know if that's a, a certain strain of so, covid where blood yeah, just comes out your own <laughs> you, you cry blood comes out your ears who knows um uh, yeah, I, I don't know where that comment sort of comes in, but any, anyway. He was, he was going, he's only got 50, uh, I know it now, so he's, he's only done 50 dives, ah. and he has at the moment because of COVID. So he can't. Because he's obviously not been allowed to dive. That so he's sense. only still got 50 dives. Well done, Sean. Are um, you sure you read this, Mark? Do you want me to take up? I'm joking. You can carry on. Um, anyway, I searched for one minute, uh, as you should do, and then started my ascent uh, going back to the shop area 225 degrees. I'm not sure whether that's is that what the shot's compass bearing is that the shot or whether um, it's a typo um it was 25 degrees and i don't know um but they were uh but was pushing 10 meters per minute as like an ascent rate so that's fairly quick um so on the uh, the limit in my mind so, i mean you can go up a little bit faster if it's an emergency but yeah just stick to your computer I then did a three minute safety stop. Yep. Um, I don't know why in hindsight, because it was the right thing to do, um, but it made sense at the time. Uh, when I surfaced, my buddy was out of the water already and discussing the incident with a teacher at the site. Later, he spent the nights in the chamber uh, and was okay, thankfully, after making a rapid ascent from 14 meters due to a free flow. Uh, after trying to resolve the issue, um, the surface was closer than me, so he ascended. Um, I still feel bad about the safety stop, though, as I didn't know his condition at that time, so should, uh, so should have blown it off, but just went through the motions and knew they could see my bubbles, probably thinking, WTF is he doing? That and another incident had uh, left him with a loss of confidence and me questioning mm. my decisions when the puppy hits the fan. Ah, <laughs> uh, what could use of words yeah. there? Um, I'd love to know your thoughts, either to put my conscience at, uh, at rest or help me decide to just play golf. Um, okay, so there's a few different things in there. So the first one is like free-flying regulator. You're taught you can still breathe from a free flowing regulator, um, and you have a surprising amount of time. Um, I mean, unless you're literally, you've only got a few bar left. Um, I, I don't know why you'd be more than 14 meters away from your buddy, um, but your buddy would be closer, or indeed any other scuba diver. If you turn around and you legitimately can't find your buddy and you have a free flowing regulator, uh, then yeah, up to the surface. But you can still do it at a, a controlled rate and 
just watch your pressure gauge, uh, watch your depth and do as much of a stop and like do it as slowly uh, as you can. He did the right thing. He spoke to um, sort of an attendant and the dive site and then ended up in the chamber and he's fine. As far as you, so you're diving along, you turn around and your buddy is gone. You looked around for a minute and then, yeah, you did the right thing. You go up, you do your uh, sort of safety stop because in that case, if you had missed a safety stop, then there's potentially two victims in the water that need recovering, uh, search and recovering. Someone has to physically notice that you're both missing, raise an alarm and then get into the water and then try and find you and recover you. So actually, no, in doing a safety stop, you're doing the right thing. You're making sure that you are okay. And then when you reach the surface, then you can raise an alarm. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have skipped a stop, I don't think. Um, unless it was a shallow, shallow dive and I knew that um, I could just go straight up to the surface. Uh, yeah, I'd be fine with doing a safety stop. It then gives you a little bit of time to send up DSMBs and to look around for trails and bubbles as well, because that could be another way of finding your buddy. If you're just hanging out at sort of five meters or something, you look around and you see a solo stream of bubbles, that could be your buddy. So um, no, I, I think you did the right thing and that's probably what I would do in that scenario. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, the thing that I was come that comes to to the thought after me reading that, and obviously not not being a teacher or anything, or not even really diving, um, but you've got to look out for number one. You've got to look after yourself. Yes, your buddy's in danger, but like Mark said, if you were to quickly rush to them or to try to get to the surface to figure out what's going on, you're putting yourself in danger, which then could lead to two casualties, which then needs more people going into the water to try and find you, which then could lead to another accident. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, you got to think. Think you got to be selfish in that sort of situation. Yes, you want to, you know, help your buddy out. You want to make sure that they're okay or to figure out what on earth's going on. But mm. you, you've got to be safe yourself at the end of the day as well. You know. Yeah, I mean, I've been in scenarios where I've been to like swimming along, and and my buddy, for whatever reason, just went to just dive down deeper beyond our max depth, and you just it's well, because they didn't like you, Mark. They just wanted to get away because I smelt. Um, and <laughs> and you're like, well, I'm not willing to go beyond my depth limits. Um, mm. So yeah, I just stuck with other divers. It, it's kind of, it, That's it's, it. it's not a nice decision, but it's kind of one of those decisions where you have to yeah, make sure that you don't become a victim yourself um, who needs rescuing. Yeah. So no, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I think you did the right thing in yeah, making sure that you're okay. And at the end of the day, it all ended well, everyone, and granted he ended up in a chamber, so I imagine he got a bill for that, but at least he's healthy, so. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's alive, yeah, it's all good. All right, cool, let's uh, move on to the next question, question number six. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Ahmed El Ramali. Mm -hmm. Ramali? Yep. Cool, sweet. He says, hi, Mark. Uh, yeah, hi, cheers, mate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Could you make a comparison between the Tusa Par Paragon mask mm -hmm. and the Atomic Aquatic Subframe Art mask? Which one would you choose? Uh, the Zegel Scope mask mm -hmm. and the Terek. And the Shearwater Terek. Um, and the Shearwater Terek. Uh, so they're different. They're obviously different masks, but they... <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so these they're are both... Uh, they're both twin lens masks, although the Paragon does come in a single lens version. There's the Paragon S. Uh, although the arc coating on the uh, Atomic, you can get that on the Venom, which is a single lens. Um, but the coatings are different. Paragon has their 420 um, coating. <laughs> nice. I know. 420. Yep. <clears throat> Um, so that, that cuts out uh, wavelengths of 420 nanometers like UV light, um, so it cuts that out, so it's acting a lot like sunglasses, uh, whereas the ARC, the anti-reflective coating on the, uh, on the subframe, is allowing a greater amount of light to come through. It reduces the reflections on the glass, which is pretty clever. So you get less of that like ghost reflection. If you're looking around and the sun comes in at a certain angle, you see reflection of your own eye, which is a bit trippy. Um, but also 
less light is being reflected off of your lenses, so more light is transferring into the mask, but it's not specifically mm. cutting out any specific wavelengths, I don't think. Um, so it's whether you want, so the Paragon masks are more for protecting your eyes. So if you're diving in uh, like the tropics, lots of sunlight, you spend a lot of time on the surface, it's bouncing off the waves, it's getting into your eyes. Over time, that is gonna damage your eyes. Um, that's the Tutor Paragon, that's gonna protect your eyes against that uh, UV light. The Subframe Arc is more for like visual quality because it uh, sort of increases contrast. You can see more vivid colors, um, but I don't think it filters out any uh, specific um, wavelengths of light. So it's swings and roundabouts. You, you'll both have fun, but in slightly different ways. Uh, to sure. choose choose between them, for my diving, I'd probably go for the Atomic, because um, I don't always dive in bright, sunny countries. Um, but if I did live on the equator, and yeah, I did go diving in the Caribbean, wherever it was, then yeah, I'd probably lean more towards the, uh, the Paragon to protect my eyes. Cool. I would say just buy both. So when you're above the water. When, when, when you get to the, the surface, on, take, then, take your subframe yeah. off and put your paragon on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then when you go under the water, I just put. Yeah, yeah. mask swap. Both, That's mate. why we trade. That's why you have two pockets. <laughs> A surface mask and an underwater mask. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't want to get your surface mask wet, let's mm. be honest. No, just attach God. that to a surface marker, boy. <laughs> <laughs> an open one. That's what they're for. <laughs> They can hold the mask. So it's still your mask. Oh, no, I don't know where I'm going with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, normally that would be it, but we actually have a little bonus question this week. You're welcome, guys. Cool. Uh, it, it's from African Twin. Uh, not my African Twin. Uh, that's his <laughs> name or their name. Let's see. How would the UK Brexit affect sales of scuba market outside the UK? Otter dry suits are already in the Santi Emotion price range. Um, and then they diverged ever so slightly. The Raspberry Pi has been priced up by 12% in Germany and in the Netherlands. So Brexit and the scuba diving market, Mark. Have fun with that question. <laughs> um, yeah, so so Brexit, Brexit has its, its like pros and cons. Uh, for the diving industry, a lot of stuff is manufactured in Italy, uh, there's a few bits in Germany as well, um, all, all over the world. But the the big like heavy hitters are like Italy, France, Germany. Uh, we do have some here in the UK. You've mentioned Otter. We got Apex as well. Uh, fourth Element down on the uh, south coast. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of little sort of independent ones. So yeah, it's it's kind of is tough if you're a manufacturer shipping like into or out from uh, the united kingdom then yeah there's all sorts of new like um what you call it taxes and stuff trying to get things shipped to and from so costs and uh sort of prices are going to start to kind of shift i think one almost good thing about it is that there'll probably be a bit more clarity in where things are coming from when you're buying things online because we had it uh, sort of a few years ago one one thing that we were acutely aware of was a lot of european dive center shops were selling things as if they were UK dealers. So people would see the cheaper price because they were buying it in euros, but trans, uh, what you call it, uh, converting it into like British pounds. And then when it arrives, one, you've got the, the longer shipping times, uh, but two, it's almost a gray import because you've bought it in a different economic area um so trying to claim under warranty was tricky because you'd have to return it to wherever um whereas now i think there's probably going to be a bit more of an obvious gap in oh, okay that's why the shipping cost is so high um or when it arrives you, you may have to pay um some kind of shipping tax when it's over a certain value so um yeah it's it's interesting we, we still don't know the the full effect of Brexit, uh, even though it happened, what, over a year ago? Uh, January was this year, wasn't it? 
Was that this year? I don't yeah, know. So, we, so it, we've been talking it for it you know, for about six years. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it happened last, like basically, I think the when we officially split from Europe was last January. Yeah. No, it, but then the paperwork got all confirmed the last December, so it was the start of this year. I think I it was one of those things. Me. Yeah, we've. It's been in the news for I don't know so many years that yeah. you, you it just becomes white noise, just background noise. You don't mm -hmm. even, unless you physically cover the stories uh, and read all the legislation. It is just yeah. I, don't know. Um, also, as well, I was going to yeah. say, like with Brexit, this, this has only just happened, so there's always going to be upsets. There's always going to be extra paperwork. There's always going to yeah. be prices. You know, it's going to take three, you know, maybe you know, three, four, five years for it to everything to settle down and just to everything run smoothly because mm. this is the new norm. This will be become the, the new norm. And mm. also, as well, when when other negotiations that happen under the table or you know in Parliament. Um, or however they're done, um, things will get cheaper. Things, mm. you, you know, it's only because it's just happened and everything's so new. And there's been a lot of companies that not necessarily have ignored it, but they're not prepared. They haven't gone, okay, so this is where I order stuff from. Mm. Um, oh, okay, Brexit's happened. I've got to order, oh, I've got to pay for these again. Oh, no, I'm going to have to try and find another supplier that's outside the EU. Mm. Um, I've found a lot of people, or I know a lot of people that sell independently, um, and basically, yeah, they used to purchase from online, uh, mm. from Europe, but now we're outside of the EU. They've actually turned to Japan, um, and yep. depending on how the currency is, they buy it from Japan, um, and then they get it sent to them. Obviously, it's getting sent to the um, to the UK or whatever, so technically it probably is a grey import, but depending on what it is, the customer then obviously purchases purchases it from them, but then there's that that system. It's not like you're buying directly from the company yeah. to go to you. You know, you're you're using. There's a middleman there that can sort mm. out if there's any any issues on there. So, but but again, what they're doing is now they're buying from outside the EU because we legally can. It's actually cheaper for them. Yeah. So I know a lot of people that have reduced <clears throat> their prices mm. because they can because of Brexit. But then that's. That's highs and lows. That's all depending yeah. on currency and exchange rates. And yeah, yeah. There's lots think, of things. Yeah, I think as well, because there was something that we even looked at was having a separate distribution, almost mm. warehouse, where, yeah, you have like, you have one shop in uh, in the EU, you have one shop in the UK, and then you can yeah, kind I of deal to, to both markets. So I think, Obviously, depending on the um, the uh, the manufacturer or the retailer, it might end up sort of cheaper in the long run to uh, do it that way. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely mixed mixed a lot up, and um, <laughs> we we haven't entirely seen exactly um, what's uh, what the change is going forwards. But uh, yeah, I think sort of clarity in that yeah, this is definitely coming from a UK dive centre. Um, mm. It comes with a full UK warranty and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's going to be a little bit better. Um, but yeah, getting hold of some of the more, not exotic, but uh, sort of European stuff might be a little bit slower or a bit more expensive or, I don't know, a bit cheaper. It depends on um, like currency exchange rates and everything. Um, but it might start to see some new brands coming in, uh, brands exactly. that we uh, sort of couldn't um, get beforehand. Who knows? Time, time will tell. Um, Who knows? And yeah, <laughs> I can't wait for there to be a brand new scuba diving brand um, called the British Bulldog. You have bulldog <laughs> regulators. You have well, the we Churchill have, BCD. Um, we used to have the the Shearwater Brute. Um, <laughs> that... <laughs> that doesn't start with a P. <laughs> no, that was um, no. Sher Sher Sherwood? Sheer Sherwood? I know the one, yeah. Sheer it wasn't, yeah, I know yeah, it wasn't sheer water, that's just what comes to mind. Um, but yeah, the, the brute regulator. You're like, okay, okay. cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it drink it only it doesn't it doesn't run on air, it runs on a uh, cans of Stella. <laughs> and the regulator bag is a white uh, white vest. A white <laughs> a wife beater vest as it's known in England. <laughs> 
Oh, no, with um, the sharp Ignorance white lightning. <laughs> oh, dear. I oh dear. <laughs> and on that um, bombshell. Yeah. yeah, on that bombshell, I'll uh, I'll do the outro. Um, oh, I'm so good at doing them now. Because you failed last week. I did. You've had this revoked. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, comments, queries, or corrections to anything that you've seen or heard of um, in today's video, let us know down in the comments below or on any of our social media channels. Uh, if you can, try and use the hashtag AskMark, so just the pound sign, if anyone still calls it a pound sign, um, the, the hashtag, and then AskMark, all one word, just makes it a lot easier for us to find it. Um, anything about scuba diving, uh, sort of apnea, free diving, or um, you can also ask Sean a question about uh, downhill mountain biking, um, snowboarding, skiing, um, oh, not, up, not necessarily skiing. <laughs> Synchronized swimming, oh, uh, tiddly, tiddlywinks. Um, pogs, yeah. mate. I'm all about pogs. pogs. <laughs> and uh, uh, let uh, us... the real Ghostbusters action toys. <laughs> let us know down in the uh, in the comments below. Uh, if you want any of our Simply Scuba merchandise, we have a spring store. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, it, there'll be a banner underneath this video. At the moment, there is a 10% discount code running, but you have to watch one of our Daily Scuba News videos to watch that. Uh, we mm -hmm. have two separate sponsors for that, uh, so you might have to watch a few of them before you find one of them and find the code. Um, yeah, uh, Don't forget to, uh, to check out simplyscuba.com because we have all sorts of interesting uh, scuba diving equipment. Buy your uh, with... open cell... Uh... Uh, DS and B's guys. We do I want to see them sold out. Like this time next week, I want them all sold out because you've all bought them. I imagine they will just because they've got X Deep stamped on them. People love X Deep, so they'll just buy it. Um, yeah. We'll I mean, the, the, the quality is good. It's just, yeah, personally, I don't like open no. DS and B's. Shh, shh, shh. shh. They're they also amazing. offer closed cell DS and B's. Um, buy them both. Yeah, they have a few different. Yeah, compare them uh, and let no, us know. No, no, don't, don't compare them. What you do, you use the open cell as a cover for the closed <laughs> cell. So you put that over it and then you inflate the closed cell. So it doesn't discolour in the sun. Exactly. <laughs> exactly um, that. Uh, anyway, uh, that's it for uh, for today's videos. Yeah, any questions, comments, queries, let us know down in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you're listening to this as a podcast, if we still do this as a podcast, thank you for listening. We do. Um, and of course, safe diving. Yeah, man. Stay classy scuba divers. Yes. <laughs>